Thanks. Thanks very much for uh, the invitation to come and talk about some very recent results. Uh, some of them are still kind of ongoing. And thanks to anyone who's still here. I was, I was kind of worried talking to people on the week, finding out how many people were leaving early, that there would be only five of us here in the last session. So uh, I'm happy to hear that there are more. So this is kind of a long title. Uh, I thought I would simplify it a little bit. Um, as really what I want to just talk about, the main focus of this is that time multiplexing can be an extremely useful tour, tool for improving rates uh, in experiments and maybe having some other benefits as well. So uh, this is what I want to try to quickly go over in the next uh, 15 minutes or so. Uh, an optimized source of single photons and how we can combine that with temporal multiplexing uh, toward doing a, uh, an enhanced MDI QKD protocol. And one of the, uh, the phenomena that we'll use is this, what I'll call the birthday phenomenon. That's the fact that you know, in this room, certainly two people probably have the same birthday. Even though it might not be anyone's birthday today, there's a high likelihood that two people would have some same birthday. And we'll see how that comes in. Um, does anyone have a birthday today? Oh, happy birthday, Anne. <laughs> OK, unplanned. Um, OK, and then I'll talk about some of our data and where we might go from here. And then if there's a little bit of time, I might talk about some other related work on a digital quantum memory. So uh, the work I'm going to be talking about today, uh, this is my research group. We have a high address code. Uh, anyway, it's uh, almost entirely done uh, by Fumi Hirakaneda, po my postdoc, who's, you know, working as we speak back in the lab. Uh, and then Alex Hill is also helping on uh, some of the experimental aspects. And uh, we're always on the lookout for uh, classy new scientists to, uh, to join us. So I just want to say a little bit about single photon sources. So uh, this was not a single photon workshop, of course. Uh, but many of you know, for example, quantum dots are often uh, posed as a very good single photon source or nitrogen vacancies. So I just picked one paper. There's a fairly recent one uh, from John Wei Pan's group. Uh, on-demand single photons with high extraction efficiency, 66% single photon purity, really good, photon indistinguishability, really good. So it kind of sounds like that's already solved the problem. Why do we need to worry about single photon sources? The problem is that if you actually look at the actual efficiency that they have, for example, coupling into single mode fibers, uh, the actual efficiency is something more like 5%. Even if you divide out the detector efficiency, it's at best 15%. So I don't consider 15% to be very on demand. Uh, if you order things from Amazon and they only came to you 15% of the time, I guess you would stop ordering from Amazon. So another source that has um, a long history, of course, is parametric down conversion, where we take a nonlinear crystal, pump it with a high energy photon, and get two daughter photons out. Uh, and if you detect one of those daughter photons, you know with a high probability that the, uh, there's a second photon, the so-called idler photon. So we have a source like this now. Um, it's at, uh, we're pumping at 521 at 100 megahertz pulses. And uh, it's very non-degenerate. So one of the photons is at 775 nanometers. That's going to be our trigger. That's going to tell us that there's a photon in the other arm. And that's a good wavelength because that's where our uh, silicon detectors are very efficient. And then the other wavelength is going to be at 1590 nanometer photons. And that's good because it's a low loss region and fiber, low dispersion. So uh, with this source, we actually have an 88% heralding efficiency. This would be the extraction efficiency that was uh, Actually, no, this is not the extraction efficiency. This is actually coupling into a single mode fiber. If you detect one of the photons, what's the chance the other uh, photon goes into its single mode fiber? Uh, so as far as I know, that's maybe the highest or comparable to the highest that anyone has seen. Now, that in and of itself doesn't necessarily make it useful for multiple photon experiments, and that's what we want. We want an experiment where we're going to be combining photons from different sources. And in order for those to be able to interfere with each other, it's important that this photon not be entangled to this other photon, because that will mess up any kind of multiple photon interference. So I need these to be at least spectrally uh, unentangled with each other. And the particular crystal that we're using, and it's designed to have group velocity matching, uh, means that the, the joint spectra of the two photons is nearly factorizable. Here's the theoretical, here's the experimental. In other words, measuring the signal wavelength doesn't really tell you much about the, the idler wavelength. So the true test of that is to do a hongo mandel experiment where you mix two of the photons, two, two sequential of these 1590 nanometer photons on a beam splitter, and we see that we get a, a quite good hongo mandel dip. Uh, if we just take the raw data with no filtering, uh, we get about a 90% spectral purity. And if we just put some narrow filters on the signal side, we don't even have to put them on the idler side. We put them on this side. So it doesn't hurt our heralding efficiency at all. Uh, that goes up to like 97%. OK, so now we have a source which is very efficient and also very pure. 
One problem is that because it's down conversion, uh, we have these pulses that come in, but we don't know whether or not a pulse is going to give a pair. Maybe it gives no pair. If the pulse is really bright, you might get two pairs, but it's, it's, um, I wouldn't say that it was on demand uh, in any sense. We can fix that by using time multiplexing to create basically a periodic source. So what's going to happen here is we're going to drive a crystal with a bunch of pulses and uh, we will simply see which of the pulses have a pair by uh, monitoring with this detector and then we will store uh, the, the conjugate photon, the photon that we want, in a little storage cavity here that's made with a, a Pockel cell and, and a polarizing beam splitter. So, for example, if this is the pulse where we detect a, a trigger, we will then fire our polarization switch. We will store that photon in this little loop until the end of however many, however many cycles we're using this for, and then we will fire this uh, Pockel cell again, and then that switches the photon out. And uh, it's easy to show that if you have a lossless storage cavity, and the probability of making a pair in any given pulse is small, then the probability that you'll get one photon out at the end of all n cycles is given by this expression. And I guess the thing to see is that, so one minus p is less than um, one. So if you make the number of cycles very large, then this probability can approach one. So you effectively get deterministic generation even uh, though you have a, a probabilistic source. And the, the G2, the, the fraction of two photon probability, uh, is effectively independent of n in this case. So uh, we set this up about a year ago and uh, were able to get at the time, I guess, the, uh, the world's highest uh, efficiency results. It was, a, it was a probability of having a photon in a particular time bin at this periodic source was about 39%. Um, and with more efficient components that we now have in place, we should be able to get something like, uh, like 80% in a G2 uh, close to just a few percent. Uh, I'm not going to talk now about this so much. I want to go change gears a little to uh, MDI QKD. So, so, of course, the way I think about this is that we have an entangled source and we send to the two sides, and I'm going to turn that backwards to get the MDI QKD. So I'll have two sources, maybe faint laser sources. I do some encoding. Uh, I send the, the pulses to the middle. I do a Bell state measurement, and that, the result of that Bell state measurement is then announced to the uh, the people at the edges, and then they identify the cases where they use the same basis for their encoding. Uh, and then if, if, for example, they have the state psi minus, uh, then they know they should have had opposite results, and, and then they get their key. So um, one difficulty with this, if you use faint laser sources, uh, is, well, first of all, they uh, potentially have to be, uh, things have to be stabilized with respect to each other. And in addition, uh, they have to be identical to each other. And also, the best visibility that you can get in this Bell state measurement is only 50%. So if instead we could use a heralded photon source, uh, that would be great, just a single photon source, because then we'd get uh, this hongo mendel visibility to go up to 1. Now, there is a problem, though, in that if I just take a normal source that I'm pulsing without doing any of this time multiplexing, the chance, because the likelihood of getting a pair in any given pulse is small, the chance that uh, the two photons will come from equivalent pulses on the two sides is very small. So in particular, let's say I had 50 pulses and there's one photon in each of those pulses on either side, the chance that it's going to be in the same pulse, that they're both going to be in pulse 17, is not very big. Okay, so that's not going to be helpful. But if we use the multiplexing technique I just talked about, where we have a periodic single photon source, that will help because then things are coming essentially always periodic with each other at the same time bit. Uh, okay, but that's actually not what we did because it turns out that this is not really the smartest thing to do to use these uh, uh, delay lines, these switchable delay lines, to force both of the photons to come, let's say, in time bin number one. Or in, maybe I should say in time bin 50. That's not going to be the best thing because you're forcing the photons to sit in these delay lines longer than they probably have to. So instead, what you can do uh, is it's based on the fact that we don't actually care which time bin the two photons arrive in as long as they arrive to the central station in the same time bin. It doesn't matter that they're both in time bin 50. They just both have to be in the same one, but I don't care which of the time bins 1 through 50 that they're in. So what I can use then is a, uh, what I might call a relative temporal multiplexing. Terry Rudolph, I think, introduced this notion, or at least I maybe heard it from him. So the idea is that I have a, a, a pulse source it's pulsed, but I haven't put any time multiplexing on it yet. So I've got maybe 50 pulses coming from here, 50 pulses coming from here, 
and I send the, the conjugate photons to the center station, uh, which holds onto them, waits till we get classical information from these detectors saying which of the time bins the photon was coming in. So there's information, for example, from this one, oh, the photon's coming in time bin 17, and from this one we get the information that the photon's coming in time bin 27. So the, synchron the person in the middle then knows, oh, I need to delay the first one by 10 time bins, and then it will be matched with the second one. I need to shift it from time bin 17 into time bin 27, and then, and then it will be matched. And then as soon as they get a match, then they, can, then they can restart and they can just send another pair. So we don't have to wait for this whole cycle time. We can kind of continuously upgrade this. Uh, okay, and then that gives completely synchronized photon pairs at the source. So what this looks like in, or could look like in practice, is that we would have to have, for each of the photons, one of these switchable delay lines. So again, the way this works, uh, I have a photon comes in, it's, say, horizontally polarized, the Pockel cell switches it to vertical, uh, and then it just loops around, uh, reflecting off this polarizing beam splitter every time, until I fire the Pockel cell again, and then I release it. And I do the same thing on the other side. Um, so a, a slightly different version of that, uh, which you could either call a poor man's version or a clever man's version, uh, is this. So uh, the photon comes from Alice, it passes through an optical circulator, so at the moment this device doesn't do anything. It goes into the storage system, it's going around uh, clockwise. At some point I switch it out and then it goes out this output port through this opt optical circulator and now it comes down here. And similarly, Bob's photon does the same thing but uh, going in the counterclockwise direction and comes out here. So I'm able to get away with having only a single loop, a single Pockel cell, everything is time. If, if this loop length changes a little bit, it doesn't really matter because it's affecting both of the things the same way, so it's uh, relatively stabilized. Okay, so what does uh, data look like from that? So this is uh, actually as of just a, uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, so our sources are producing pairs at about 0.02 two pairs per pulse, so that means the likelihood that we're producing two pairs in a pulse, which would be bad from a security standpoint, is only about 1%. Uh, but, I mean, so that 1%, eventually we have to do privacy amplification, because an eavesdropper in principle could get information from that, uh, unless we do some sort of a decoy, uh, decoy pulse analysis. And what we see, for example, this is the rate at which these two uh, heralded single photon sources uh, are sending a photon somewhere within the n cycles, and I'm as a function of n. And not surprisingly, that rate goes quadratically with n because if, uh, if I just increase n, well, and I have more time bins that I could be getting photons from Alice, that's gonna increase linearly, and similarly, more time bins that I could get photons from Bob, that's gonna increase linearly. The product of those two things will go up quadratically. Uh, and what we then see in our experiment is our uh, fourfold coincidence count rate uh, is also going up quadratically. And I guess I just want to say if we, that maybe the key takeaway here is this curve, which is the enhancement that we get over if we had an asynchronous case. So if we weren't doing this time multiplexing, uh, how much more, how many more pairs do we get coming out exactly the same time bin? And uh, we've seen something at like 30 when we're going up at 40 uh, loops. Uh, in fact, with our system, we could go up to about 100 loops, uh, and then we would get an enhancement factor of about 50. So in terms of actually doing uh, encoding, for MDI uh, QKD, we can't use polarization with this particular scheme because all of our switches are based on polarization. So that's not gonna work. Uh, but instead, we could use time bin coding as long as the difference between the two time bins that we're using is less than the loop time so that we can switch them both in or both out. Now, there's another difficulty with that, which is that if you're going to try to resolve the two time bins, T1 and T2, then the difference between them has to be bigger than the resolution time of your detector, which let's say is of order a nanosecond, so we don't have any errors. Uh, so now I have these unbalanced interferometers at the sources, and they have to be phase stabilized with respect to each other, because otherwise these phases that they're implementing are gonna be drifting, and so that's not gonna be so easy. Um, but it turns out there's uh, another nice feature about the, uh, the Bell state analysis which is that the Hongo mandel uh, measurement doesn't really care if you can resolve the two time bins. So we can do our encoding uh, simply using, uh, say, T1 plus or minus T2 or T1 plus or minus IT2. Even though our detectors can't resolve T1 and T2, uh, when you send these on to the, uh, the beam splitter, when we get a coincident detection, uh, we still know that we had the state psi minus or psi plus. And so it turns out that that's gonna be much easier to implement. 
Okay, so the next steps for us are to characterize the Bell state analysis. Uh, we just saw a dip this morning between these two different photons. Uh, to put in the time bins and the encoding, and then to realize the synchronization enhanced uh, QKD. Uh, but really, I think the main message for this talk is not that we can do MDI QKD, because uh, it might be that you're still better off doing it with weak coherent pulses, because you can drive them at a gigahertz or something like that. I think the, more, the bigger point is that this could be a useful, this time multiplexing and synchronization could be very useful for a whole host of other protocols. So in particular, uh, if we, if we make our photons so that they're time bin entangled with each other, which is easy to do just by sending in a coherent um, combination of two pump pulses, uh, then we should be able to demonstrate synchronization enhanced entanglement swapping, where again, we're getting enhancements in rates of order 50 or something like that. So that's getting to be pretty significant, and I think will be a critical component for any quantum repeater network. And we could then also think about not just stopping with two photons, but let's say we want to generate larger photon states. So we want to not just have two photons simultaneous, but we want to have 10 photons simultaneously going into some sort of circuit. And so here's a, uh, just a calculation. Uh, this is assuming that instead of running with our laser at 100 megahertz, we were running at a gigahertz, uh, which in principle we could get a laser that would do that. And as a function of loss, uh, what's the generation rate we could have, for example, of a uh, 10 individual photons, or in this case, of 20 individual photons. And if we have something like a 1% loss, which, by the way, I should say, in our current experiment, our loop loss is 1.2%. So it's a really, really low loss. Uh, then, in fact, we could expect uh, to get something of the order of um, 10 to the, almost 10 to the 7, 10 megahertz, 10 photon events coming out of these sources. So that's a, that's a huge boost over what people currently can do, where people are instead waiting for 20 minutes to get one 10-photon event. We could even uh, look at, ten, at 20 photon events, and uh, it's a little easier to see on the log scale uh, here, but you know, it's, we could imagine having something like 1,000 20-photon events per second. So this is, I think, now becoming potentially enabling technology. Uh, the one caveat I would say uh, is that you need to have low loss and that's an issue I think that the people working with integrated uh, photonic circuits really need to work on, is really trying to push losses low. Most of the time, they'd be pretty happy if they only had a 20% loss. But if you put a 20% loss in one of these things, you've completely lost, you've lost the entire benefit. So um, this is a summary. Uh, just we have a quite good source now, I would say. I, I guess I might claim it's, it's the best. Uh, down conversion source for this sort of work that, that I've seen anyway. We, when we combine it with temporal multiplexing, we get a nearly deterministic periodic source. We can use that with one of these uh, uh, controllable memories to do synchronization for MDIQKD and, and other things as well, uh, other multiple photon protocols as well. And I think I will, uh, I'll stop there. And if anyone wants to ask me about the cool digital quantum memory, uh, I'll take a question on that. But thanks. All right, we have time for maybe one quick question. I have 18 minutes on my clock, <laughs> so we should be OK. OK. I, w I was wondering, what, what is the effect of uh, inefficiency on, in the trigger detect, uh, trigger, trigger photon? Yeah, because if, if you have a very low uh, efficiency, you have a multi-photon multi ev uh, event, right? Uh, yeah. you, you, so you can get around, so the question is, uh, does it hurt you to have a low trigger efficiency? It's not really that bad. So first of all, you can, it's a remarkable, because you have all these different time bins, you can get the output efficiency to be higher than the trigger efficiency, because you're able to try, let's say, on 500 pulses, uh, even though I might miss, let's say I have 10 photons in those 500 pulses, and I might only see one of them, because my efficiency is only 10%, I still get a photon that comes out at the end. The effect of multiple photon pulses, to the extent that you can keep your losses low, you can keep the multi-photon uh, probability low by having not a high amplitude in any given pulse. So it's a low probability per pulse of making a pair, but a high probability in all n pulses of making a pair. Now I have 30 seconds. <laughs> OK. A really quick question? Or we could do like 20 seconds of applause. 